All Gaul is divided into three parts, one of which the Belgae inhabit, the Aquitani another, those who in their own language are called Celts, in ours, Gauls the third. geography, um, but also a little bit of Republican history, a little bit of imperial history, a little bit of late imperial history, um, a little bit of everything. Uh, my name is Russell Smith. I'm here at Bowdoin. I'm a former staff member, former student. Uh, I have the privilege of knowing this fine group of folks who are not only interested in gaming, but who are excellent, interesting people, professors who teach very, very good stuff. and. Uh, my pleasure to be able to participate and run through rules a little bit. Uh, my name is Rob Sobak. Uh, I am Associate Professor of Classics here at Bowdoin College. Uh, my area is specifically really 6th and 5th century BC Greek history, um, but I also occasionally teach Roman history, uh, processing in the history department as well. Uh, my name is Mike Nerdall. I'm a classicist here at Bowdoin College. I'm a lecturer. Um, I'm big into incorporating games into my classroom. In particular, I've done role-playing games, role immersion games, and uh, I've also created my own role immersion games, including, in particular, uh, a game on the Trojan War and a game on the Republic of Rome itself. Yeah, I, so I also design tabletop role-playing games, um, and I have designed some board games as well. Uh, and I've been playing board games and strategy games and tabletop miniatures war games for a very long time. So it's my understanding that the coin series is originated by a, a fellow who's an analyst in the U.S. intelligence community. Um, he's a very, very sharp individual. He and folks who followed his lead have developed a system whereby, uh, rather than taking sort of what I would say the conventional approach of looking at boots on the ground, they're looking, and, and uh, this individual, Mr. Brunke, uh, is looking at a more holistic view uh, of conflicts, specifically counterinsurgency conflicts. So by taking any conflict that uh, is being modeled, we're looking at the effects of popular support, we're looking at the reasons that uh, the home, what should we call it, uh, the home opinion will affect your ability of any given side to commit to a given conflict, the ways in which that may restrict uh, the amount that you can commit to a conflict, uh, and most interestingly, the ways in which one side may influence their opponent's ability to commit to a conflict indirectly rather than directly through force hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, so to speak. The Romans formed a line of mantlets and constructed a siege terrace. When they began to erect a siege tower at some distance, the defenders on the wall at first made abusive remarks and ridiculed the idea of setting up such a huge apparatus so far away. Did those pygmy Romans, they asked, with their feeble hands and muscles, imagine that they could mount such a heavy tower on top of a wall? All the Gauls are inclined to be contemptuous of our short stature, contrasting it with their own great height. But when they saw the tower in motion and approaching the fortress walls, the strange, unfamiliar spectacle frightened them into sending envoys to ask Caesar for peace. The envoys said they were forced to the conclusion that the Romans had divine aid in their warlike operations, since they could move up apparatus of such height at such a speed. He had no anticipation that this would be so tremendously successful and so appealing to people that other folks would jump on and 
and try to look at all sorts of things occurring throughout history this way. Um, I think it's fascinating because it's always interesting to start with the idea that if this model works here or if this approach works here, can we extend it? Can we get value? How do we assess that value? How do we assess the, let's say, the leakages and accuracy as we go beyond? Uh, but it's particularly interesting to me in this one setting because as we go back into early, early times from our point of view, um, one of the assumptions made right off in the, this particular model is to remove something that occurs in all the modern conflict models, which is to say we de-emphasize one half of the equation. We de-emphasize popular support and we make it more primitive in its approach, but we still apply it just through different mechanisms. And that's really fascinating to me because it's, it's a very explicit way of looking at one particular thing that's evolved over time. Great. Caesar's uh, passage in book six about the Gauls and the ethnography and geography of the Gauls, or his ethnography, I guess, in book six and his geography earlier on, I cover in my classical geography class, so that comes up. Um, and his work, his work is historically interesting for a number of other literary and historical reasons, obviously, so it does a little. I do teach a Roman history class, so I teach on the Roman Republic, how the Constitution and the political system works. I mean, I teach a broad survey of Roman history, so from the founding all the way to the fall, as it were, um, and so we can usually spend no more than one half of a week on Caesar. Mm -hmm. Just it's a it's a, a, a forced march through Roman history, right. um, and so there's just not enough time really. I assign little snippets of the Gallic Wars. And that's the extent of the exposure in that class. Mm -hmm. get. The Gallic Wars of Caesar is actually one of the most uh, useful and wonderful texts for intermediate level Latin students and advanced level Latin students. His Latin is uh, just magnificent. And so there's always been this temptation. In fact, he's recently been re included in the AP curriculum in high schools, um, in addition to Virgil. Plane and Verney, and I plan to slaughter lots of Roman legions and hopefully uh, gain enough allies and bring over enough of the other tribes to take over enough of the board. But I, I conceive of it as almost like a, a war of attrition that I think that over time I hopefully can raise more troops, take out enough Roman troops to, to make the cost great enough to where they, they no longer want to deal with this. Uh, I'm playing the Belgian side, the Belge or Belge. Um, What's happening is that in the particular setting we have, which is the primary setting for this conflict, uh, in this box at least, um, we're looking at a point in history where my side has succeeded or come very close to victory in their objectives. We've had a nice pushback, everything is looking rosy for us, but as we go into this year, Caesar's coming for us explicitly because we've done so well. We've made such a, such a ruckus that if something isn't done about us promptly, the battle's done. So I'm looking at strategically and tactically the fact that the tides have to be rushing towards me. In fact, one of the things the model puts here is that if the Romans for some reason drop the ball, other people are gonna have to do something about me as well to achieve their own ends. So I know that I'm facing a tidal wave coming towards me. So strategically, I have two choices. I can either attempt to hold what I've got, and I can attempt to push that last inch just over the edge and hold on for one year or I can accept the battering and drubbing that I've earned and start planning from the get-go as to what I'll do about it later. And so tactically, that's what I'm choosing. Uh, what I'm choosing is the fact that people will be coming to crush me. I'm going to accept that that's happening. I'm not gonna give it to them willingly. I'm gonna make them pay for it. And if they make slips, sure, I'll attempt to take advantage of that opportunistically. But I thoroughly expect with the caliber of people who are here that that won't be on the, on the table for me. Uh, so I'm going to have to be planning from the get-go what I'm going to do two years from now. Today I'm playing the Aidui. The Aidui are, uh, for most of the Gallic Wars, the most staunch and powerful ally among the Gauls with Caesar. Um, uh, Caesar puts in a few cutting remarks right before the, in the year before that they actually join Vercingetorix's rebellion. Uh, this is in Book 7 of the Gallic Wars, where Vercingetorix creates this uh, big revolution. Um, and the Aedui are basically very pro-Roman, but they're passively pro-Roman. So they help the Romans out, 
um, but very rarely contribute troops to that until like late in the war when Caesar needs a bit more proof of uh, that they're reliable. And in the game, this is very much played out. The Aedui have the fewest forces that they can rally, and their goal is not military in origin, unlike the other ones in the, the other uh, tribes, but it is one of uh, influence. So the Aedui just want the most influence in Gaul, more than anybody else. And so the strategy basically is not to worry so much about a military force for the Aedui, but to help the Romans and, uh, and basically just spread. Uh, I think the, the best strategy for the Aedui is to be like ants, just cockroaches, kind of a little person here, a person, a warband here, warband here, and then use that influence to slowly expand in places because the Aedui are never going to be a big enough force to threaten Caesar. Um, and primarily the Aedui will help the, the Romans by giving them resources which they'll need in order to continue prosecuting the war. And they'll also use Caesar to keep the Belgians and the Arverni in check so that the Aedui can, can claim allies when the Romans knock these other people out. Uh, I'm playing the Romans, uh, so Caesar, uh, and my strategy will be to crush all opposition to Rome. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've played Caesar twice before, once in a solo game and once in a, in a game with actual people. Uh, and I haven't won yet, <laughs> so I'm going to not do what I did then. And I think in those, in those games, or at least in the first game against actual people, I was guilty of turtling a little bit. Uh, because there was this powerful desire, especially as a Romanist, uh, to not be a dishonor to Rome and not lose your legions. And the best way to do that is put them all together. If you put all your legions together, they're just not gonna die. They're so tough. Right. Um, but it also doesn't let you win the game. Yeah. So I'm gonna try and spread out a little bit. I'm gonna try and use, uh, gonna try and use some Caesarian strategies of rapid movement and, and be where they don't expect me to be and we'll see how that goes. I also plan to roll a lot of four pluses. Well, one of the, the sort of tensions I think that's present for the Romans is that every other tribe, including the Aedui, their success means a Roman step it, uh, falls back a little bit. And so uh, by claiming allies, I'm actually hurting the Romans. And so there might be a time when the Romans will actually march on the Aedui and knock out one of our one of my allies because I'm getting too close to victory. And um, so, but you know, that's going to, not going to be his primary focus at any point. And in fact, it's something that I'm going to have to risk happening because the way I see it is the idea we kind of have to take advantage of uh, timing um, because I can't defend myself to the same extent the other ones can. I can't form a wall around myself. I'm the most centrally located of the tribes. And so, uh, basically going to spread out and try to, to seize a proper moment in order to, to win the game by having more allies than anybody else. The Gallic Wars were essentially Caesar's attempt to make himself more powerful. Um, he was in the midst of a tremendous struggle with Crassus and Pompey, and his, so there was this three-ring circus going on between they were trying to uh, elevate themselves above the other two in particular while also keeping the Senate reasonably happy. Pompey was plainly winning that battle at this point. Um, Crassus uh, was uh, a steady number two for a long time and along came Caesar who charged up. He was a masterful manipulator and diplomat within the Roman system but uh, he, he saw that he needed more and what he needed more of was number one he needed to pay off some of massive debts and I think he really needed to prove to himself and perhaps he had a, the Civil War ultimately in mind that he did want some veteran legionaries to follow him in case uh, civil strife did strike out uh, eventually. And so Caesar needed that, um, needed those, that loyal group of soldiers that he would then use if he needed to uh, in the Civil War. So keep in mind Caesar's not, this isn't spring out of nowhere, this is something that's happened before. So where Marius and Sulla in particular were using legions that were loyal to them. He, was, uh, he really did come out of nowhere to become this third power in Rome. Uh, he was an outsider, he was part of a patrician family, which is true, but it was one that had been out of power for years. And he was an unbelievable master of logistics and diplomacy and manipulation, and just a great general tactically as well.
with and him. Our two sides have the capacity to get mm -hmm. a large number of allies. And his victory condition mm -hmm. relies on his having more allies in play than anyone else. Okay. So one of the two of us has, has to, to have lots of allies yeah. at any given time. Yeah. So and now that's treat also an area where Wait, so how much do I have? That cost me three, right? Yeah. So you're down to four. Down to four? Did you already move? Oh, you seven. already moved? Okay. Now a treat's only going to do you good where you're in the same area as... Uh, right, so I'm thinking here, obviously. obviously. Yep. Uh, so it cost me one. Again, you could also devastate on there. But yeah, I think I'll wait. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to do the entry. Flip one, you'll pay one resource. What are you taking care of this? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think that's and then did you do. add did you add one of yours on that post book? Yes. Yep. Okay. And on the way, I'm going to leave a little couple sign. All right, so we will mark that as you're gaining control there as well. Yep, thank you. Um, I am going to spend two to put down a fort and two to put down the ally. So notice you have control of the... All right. One, two, three, four. And that will also... That should also raise also your... control here. Uh, that actually will not change because you have taken that ally from subdued to allied. Yeah, that will not yep. change your victory yep. conditions. Um, to here, I'm going to flip it to reveal two warbands. So two of your guys. Yeah, I'm gonna move one into here and flip it to reveal two here. Oh, and these are scouted, right? Yes, yes they are. Okay, so I'm gonna also come into here, flip to reveal two of these guys. Um, Caesar's not a good neighbor. I'm a great neighbor. You should all put your stuff out on your lawn where I can see it. This is, this is what's happening, yeah? Tons on tons of Avernian forces against this one eight week fellow. <laughs> In the Citadel. Who's yes, and his walls. Yeah. So let's start by rampaging here, which will remove those two, I believe. So retreat me. Yeah. Yep. Unless you agree to allow me to retreat. Tempting. Let's rampage those two out. Please. To be clear, having done that, I'm just in my victory margin. You have the option for the last action, so you need to stop me. Yeah. Unless you feel extraordinarily <laughs> generous, which <laughs> history has dictated. Three, four, five, five, four. because Scott uh, versus Gedrix yep. halved against the fort is two and a half, rounded yep. down is two. Yep. So, would you like to? So I lose the. Would you like to roll for your fort? So I lose the blue guy. Well, it's actually your choice. You can Hmm. Sure. So we pay two resources to initiate the battle. Mm -hmm. And we'll follow this lovely flowchart right here, which makes it quite simple. So the first thing is, you have a choice. There are two factions present to defend, either myself as the Belgi, or you may attack the Germans. I'm going to attack the Belgi. That is unfortunate. All right, having done that, I'm going to, to, to decide and then de uh, declare whether I will be retreating or not. Mm -hmm. The way I'm going to make that decision is I'm going to take a quick calculation of how much damage you're going to do to me, and whether it's worth staying in order to have the counter attack. So you have two legions and two auxilia. Yep. That's going to be two points and a half point each for the auxilia is a total of three points attacking. So under normal conditions, what I would expect would be to lose three of these defending pieces. I would then get a counter attack with my uh, leader Ambiorix and the auxilia, which would be one and a half, that would be sufficient to get one loss, which is then halved. So one and a half halved down to three quarters with the fort, which will protect everything. Uh, so the decision I have is essentially, do I want to stay with just these left and the allies, or do I want to retreat? Uh, since I'm declaring the retreat, that's going to further have my uh, defenses. However, uh, having declared a retreat, I also have to declare to where I'm retreating. My options are only to retreat to a place with, with friendly control, which is an interesting difference in this iteration of the system. You need assistance to get out of a dangerous area. So I will remove, uh, it's my choice between Nervii and Eberonis. Uh There is no inherent value other than anything that might exist in the deck, so I'm going to remove um, and Baroness is MB or it's his, uh, hometown. I'm going to remove their VI. Historical flavor. Thank you. So now I, I've taken my one point of loss. Everything else must retreat. So what I've achieved by retreating, as opposed to 
uh, as opposed to standing and fighting, is that I've given up my counterattack, which would have been worthwhile, but I've saved an extra couple of troops. That's it what changes to no control Sounds because good. it's five to one plus four, right? Yes. And so now the Romans are in the area where they will win if they go into winter at this standing. Uh, okay, so this other battle then. Yes, I will retreat. We'll and adjust these. Yep, that puts him well into victory conditions again. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> I see you he will stay in place. It started very, very slowly, uh, just the kind of luck of the draw with respect to the deck. Um, and I was primarily concerned, which makes sense with IGE, um, because uh, they had managed to kind of swath across the middle of what I would consider my territory. Um, and that he was so close to victory that I had to sort of focus all of my resources on him. So a series of kind of uh, trading raids, which really hurt me more than the Idui. Uh, as you can see, well, as you can't see now, I was down to zero resources at the end of the year, which is no fun, um, but managed to at least take away one ally, which knocked the Idui down out of winning position. How do you, well, it's, it's been interesting. Uh, I've explored, I've explored the, um, tactical advantages of being a punching bag repeatedly. I think I've <laughs> thoroughly mastered that. Uh, I, I definitely strayed from my plan and got sucked into some bad situations. Uh, but, you know, as, as much as the Romans in the age we are talking about how they got uh, good luck and good advantages at the beginning, they played pretty flawlessly. So it was a succession of Oh look, oh look, the Romans have taken over the world. Oh look, the Romans have gone out west, the Aedui have taken over the world, and back and forth. Uh, so it's been, uh, as expected, but a little more so, a series of running around and putting out this fire, running around and putting out that fire. Uh, and that's been fun. Um, I could have done without the Germans also showing up to take <laughs> part in this party. Uh, but uh, it's been great, and it's, it's evolving nicely. I got a lot of good cards at the start, and I managed to punch the Belgi like hard, and then was positioned for a uh, attack on the Averni. Um, I didn't end up attacking them, but they attacked me, and I did a bunch of damage, so that was kind of successful. Uh, and then I managed to um, you know, win the steering contest, I guess, so the other people <laughs> took down my ally, and I didn't really have to. Uh, but yeah. It's pretty good. I probably really bad. I think I succeeded in being as mobile as I wanted to a little bit, uh, as, as much as I could have expected. I have a fort deep in Gallic territory right now, so I'm pretty happy. Uh, like I kept finding myself in positions where I knew what I wanted to do, but then for various reasons, um, there were other factors that meant that I couldn't couldn't do it. Uh, like deliver a, a really strong hit to the Averni pretty early on. Uh, the only real thing that's counterfactual, I would say, is that uh, simply that Vercingetorix has risen a little early. Um, but that's kind of built into the game. In terms of like Roman Roman movements and actions, it seems very plausible to me. This is the kind of, like if you look at a map of Caesar's conquests and where he was going and what he was doing, it's very much this kind of like movement all over the place, making alliances, balancing things conquering where he can, keeping moving. The Belgi <laughs> only really, right, to, right before winter, managed to come back and make a little bit of a fight of it. Uh, so, uh, no legions down, so I'm, I'm feeling yeah. good. A little bit of luck on the timing, and I might have won. But, you know, you spread your tentacles, you let everybody worry about each other. Let the Romans beat up on the Belgians, you let the Averni grow slowly, extra slowly this time. And then all of a sudden there's blue pieces all over the board, and then everybody complains about you. Uh, and then you get easily crushed once people start looking at you. There's a bit of a staring contest there that lasted longer than, than I actually expected, um, but it didn't end up helping me. So I'm back to, uh, I'm not in horrible shape, but I have to rebuild yeah. my, uh, my Hydra-like uh, yeah. network again. What I'm thinking as I approach this game and as I've been introduced to it is how to employ this game, what use it has for uh, students who, who get to investigate that text at a, at a richer level. The main problem with those is because with, with games like Falling Sky that are bigger and more complicated, it's a little bit trickier to bring them into a classroom. What I like is the visuals. Yeah. Right? So you get thrown dozens of tribe names mm -hmm. and the most, many of the most important ones are, are out here. And so you can at least envision where it is. Okay, so when Caesar retreated from uh, Jergovia, where was that? Uh, where was Elysia, right? 
his most famous uh, sort of double siege. Um, so you have these locations. The Belgians are actually ethnically different. They viewed themselves as different and didn't really unite. Uh, in fact, the Belovaki, when they were invited by a person Jeddak to join them, they refused um, because they said they wanted to wage war themselves. So uh, outlining them in yellow is very, uh, I think, clever and, and useful. Thinking of it, um, particularly in terms of it, it, the game reads to me as almost it, it's too dependent upon Caesar's presentation of this history, mm. um, and so we're sort of replicating the same source problems that we then encounter in dealing with that text, sure. and even like the way that they've arranged the map and conceived of the Germans, conceived of the Rhine as a sort of limitation boundary instead of what it actually was as a great trade route and connector. Um, so that's, I think, something that we need to be more aware of. And it'd be fascinating to sort of reconceptualize the game, like flip it and say, well, let's imagine this from actually the standpoint of the Celts mm -hmm. and not just the Gauls as then the Romans imagined them, but the Celts largely conceived. Then, like, even rearrange the map and how it's drawn. Yeah, we lose all the nuance and depth of the, the, the local history yeah. because we're just getting steamrolled by kind of the Roman conception of Gauls. Yeah, this kind of center periphery thing has taken hold, and that's I think that's unfortunate. What I really bring into the classroom is I want them to think about how games make arguments, and I want them to think about games that present the classical world in a certain way as making an argument about the classical world and something that we can see as representing uh, what's called in the field reception studies. But one of the problems is that how foreign Caesar is to the average student, let alone high school, even in college, students who have some familiarity with Roman history don't really know Caesar that well. And so to find a way to make the text more enjoyable and relatable uh, is a particularly, I think, uh, worthwhile uh, investigation to make. The Gauls must all do the same thing that the Helvitae had done, emigrate from their country and seek another dwelling place, other settlements remote from the Germans, and try whatever fortune may fall to their lot. <laughs>